Good evening, everybody, and welcome to PressureWise. My name is Dr. Rachel Climey, and I'm a research fellow at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research in Tasmania. I'm also the public engagement lead on the High Blood Pressure Research Council of Australia. It is my great pleasure to host this event in collaboration with the Heart Foundation and Natalie Raffel, who is the Cardiovascular Risk Reduction Manager. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would like to thank the Heart Foundation for collaborating with us to bring you PressureWise and to Servia for sponsoring the event. I would also like to thank Natasha and Jade from the High Blood Pressure Research Council of Australia for their help in organising the event. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in Australia and worldwide, killing one Australian every 12 minutes. And high blood pressure is the leading modifiable risk factor for heart disease. That's why we've put on this event for you, the Australian public, to, to provide you with up-to-date information on the risks and management of high blood pressure and the importance of having regular heart health checks. So tonight you'll hear from experts in high blood pressure and heart health and from Anne Wilk, who has lived experience with high blood pressure. Following the presentations, there will be 30 minute panel discussion. If you have any questions for our experts, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So I'll now hand over to Nat, who, in, who will introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Nat. Thanks, Rachel. Um, we've got a really exciting lineup of speakers uh, from um, really well regarded internationally and locally well regarded um, experts in this field. So I'd like to start off by uh, introducing Dr. Anastasia Mihalodou. Um, Anastasia runs the diagnostic service for 24 hour blood pressure uh, monitoring at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. And she engages in both biomedical and clinical research as head of the cardiovascular and hormo hormonal research laboratory at the Colling Institute. Um, she brings an absolute wealth of knowledge uh, to the blood pressure field and we're really looking forward to her um, telling us a little bit more about how to prevent and manage high blood pressure. Over to you Anastasia. Thank you Natalie and also thank you Rachel for um, this opportunity to present. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can't see it. Can everybody See the screen there? Oops. Yep, full screen, thank you. Thank you very much. I have nothing to disclose, except I have a conflict of interest that I'm very passionate about people measuring their blood pressure, all of us, whether you're a healthcare professional or um, a, a mum or, or a, a young student, we need to know our numbers. I've also got a conflict of interest in that I'm a strong advocate of the heart health check. And uh, as you'll hear from the, the, the great faculty that we've got here today, also making sure you use the right machine. So Dean Pinconi will follow me. So on that note, I, I'd like to, to continue by saying, well, we're here to, to work out why we are all worried about blood pressure. Now, blood pressure is an important part of, of all of our lives. And it's basically the pressure of the, uh, as the heart leaves, as the blood leaves the heart um, uh, to get to the periphery so that we can exercise and what have you. The problem and why we get concerned is that high blood pressure doesn't have any symptoms. And therefore it's known as the silent killer and a major health burden because uh, unfortunately high blood pressure affects all of the different organs and it can affect the kidneys and give you kidney failure. Everybody knows about the, the issue about stroke. It's a high risk for dementia, also diabetes and of course um, heart attacks. So we really need to make sure we know our numbers as we say. I've put these graphs up not just to highlight that this is not a problem only here in Australia, but globally. And what happens is we're all uh, concerned about the pandemic we're going through. But did you know that 10.8 million deaths occurred in 2019 and are occurring each year because of high blood pressure? It's not only in men, 
but also in women. And this is a big concern because most of us are caregivers and we don't think about measuring our blood pressure. But as you can see here, because of the font, it's high systolic blood pressure is amongst the, is the leading risk factor or, and I should say preventable risk factor, because if you get it under control, and that's why we're all here, you can prevent a lot of the complications. And it's the leading risk factor amongst these uh, risk factors. Interestingly, you, you'll note that air pollution is becoming a major concern in, in terms of our cardiovascular health. And similarly for men, it's in number two position with smoking being an issue. So moving along, because we have a short time period, because we want to hear your question, questions, in Australia, we've got 2.6 million uh, Australians having hypertension, and the prevalence is similar for men and women. And this was in 2019 based on our um, uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics data. Concerningly, and why we're here today, is that 74% of all adults uh, with measured high blood pressure did not report they had self-report that they have had hypertension. And of particular concern is that the 18 to 34 year olds, which is almost 100% or 96.6% of them measured high blood pressure, but reported that they didn't have hypertension compared to uh, uh, just over 56% for those greater than, 50, uh, than 75 year olds. So we have to really change the thinking. And just because we're young doesn't mean that we're not, uh, we're exempt from high blood pressure. Now, we all know that we get a, a concern of when we have our blood pressure measured. And in this case, high, blood, high numbers does not mean that we're doing well, unlike any other competition. And in fact, uh, we, we all know that we don't want to be labelled with having high blood pressure. Certainly, I know people who present to my clinic uh, don't really want to receive treatment. And while in most cases we might be able to prevent treatment, unfortunately we will need to start treatment if we've tried everything in terms of lifestyle uh, modifications and it's still not going down. But the important thing is we need to monitor it completely. So um, part of controlling high blood pressure or, uh, is, uh, and managing it is to measure it accurately. And while, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but while we measure it in clinic, it may be elevated as we saw, but certainly if we use automated devices, we remove that alerting response, but we should just use it as an initial screening. And if you have elevated measurements in the clinic, then it's, it's important that you have them monitored away from the clinic. If you think about it, when we go and sit in a doctor's surgery, we're usually, or, or clinic, we're, we're usually either rushed because we're doing it in between our, our other uh, life, or uh, we um, are concerned that uh, about another problem and we don't. So you really need to measure it out of clinic with home, home or ambulatory blood pressure, but it, uh, devices, but it needs to be with validated, and that means accurate devices. And depends on your preference. Now, out of clinic blood pressure gives you, uh, empowers you to take control of your uh, health and your life and to monitor your lifestyle changes. Importantly, we need to remember that you, you, you may not have elevated blood pressure, but if you do develop either arthritis or other complications, which we call mor morbidity, then you may be at risk of having your blood pressure raised later. And so you need to continually monitor. And I've presented this graph here because basically one third of our, all of us Australians have at least one or two, uh, more than one um, condition. It could be diabetes, it could be kidney disease, it could be arthritis, which is a, a prevalent. Um, stress is another factor that, uh, and, and if you're on treat, uh, medication for those treatments, you need to make sure that they're not affecting your blood pressure. And, and um, so moving along, because of time constraints, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because all of you know what you need to do. We just don't have the time to do it. And why, why we're here is to tell you that you don't have to have a, reg, a strict regimen. You, you just have to be active. And engaging in lifestyle changes may avoid having uh, treatment in medication pills, but it also will give you overall uh, health, uh, health 
and uh, heart health, which is what really important because it's not just about the blood pressure, it's about your whole system. And things like exercise, reducing weight, um, uh, reducing stress levels all contribute to a much healthier uh, attitude and, and more uh, energy. So uh, lifestyle uh, changes are really important in, in treating your high blood pressure. And you all know that, that's why we're here today. Um, if you engage in lifestyle changes, you may delay or even avoid medication. And an important one, which I've highlighted here, and uh, I'm not sure if you can see my full slide, but it is that if you have blood pressure increase, you, it, uh, you, you find it can increase with weight gain. And, and unfortunately, in Australia, we have the same problem as in globally, that weight is increasing. And so we need to make sure that we stay in a healthy weight range. That's easier said than done. And particularly for women, 60% of Australian women are overweight and, and, uh, and a higher percentage for men. But the largest increase concerningly is in the 18 to 24 year olds, uh, because they, uh, they um, are unfortunately um, have uh, the largest increase, which is concerning. And we need to make sure that we change that because ultimately, even if you're not overweight, if you've got a large waist circumference, that can have adverse consequences. It can lead to other complications. And as I've put it here, it can lead to, um, uh, I had a colleague who said, for every uh, centimeter we gain around our inch, we gain more fat around our, 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 in, in our, in our um uh, throat area, which leads to sleep apnea or sleep disturbances, which can further raise your blood pressure. Similarly, alcohol. Uh, we've all increased our alcohol consumption during the pandemic, but alcohol has beneficial effects only if you have it as one glass per day for women and two to two glasses a day for men. And moving along, my, my slides don't seem to work. And here I've put up two, two, uh, two, two uh, infographics, which show that it's a concern in that it affects all systems of the body, increases increased sympathetic nervous, it affects your kidneys, it, can, it affects your gut, it can affect all aspects of, of your, your system. And that's a concern because once you put on weight, it's very hard to remove it. Importantly, I've highlighted a different study which shows genetics as a, is a factor, particularly for women. And importantly, if uh, you need to realize as women, we are much more sensitive to the, the uh, effects of fat than men are. It's not fair, I know, I, I, I suffer it as well, but we need to be aware that it's a big risk factor and we need to keep it under control. Having said that, you know, uh, I'm going to talk about physical activity. We all know it. Uh, ideally, it's moving. So not sitting down like we're all doing now, but moving along. What we say, and, and uh, Dr. Rachel Cleamy is our guru, is 150 minutes a week or 30 minutes in most days, but can lower blood pressure five to eight millimeters if you've got high blood pressure. Moving is really important. If you can't go, go out for a walk, you can walk the stairs. You can stand while you're listening to the phone. You can move around in the office uh, uh, if you're in a desk job, but just move. We want you to keep moving because unfortunately, um, if you don't move, then the trouble is it has an adverse impact on your health. Similarly, if you have got hypertension, there have been studies, and I put this great infographic here from one of them, that it can lead to uh, uh, reduction in blood pressure just from a single bout, but we'd like you to do more. And importantly, we need to do strength training. As we get older, we need to make sure that, that we are maintaining our muscle bulk because without our mu muscles wasting away, then we're likely to fall. Importantly, and I can't stress, Talk to your doctor before you start to, to, to develop an exercise program or talk to your doctor before you, you start. And this is why we recommend the Heart Foundation Heart Health Check because you're not just checking your blood pressure, you're checking your kidneys, you're checking your, your overall health and your, your past history altogether. Now, just to finish up, it, and obviously there are many factors, I just would like to highlight we need to start early. It's not just about us 
in, in adulthood or in young teens. It starts in childhood. We're not, we don't think about measuring blood pressure in children, but we need to because there are not, there's enough strong research now around the world which shows if you don't uh, treat blood pressure in children, then they develop far more, greater risks in, in adulthood or in adolescence. And that's a much longer time period to have high blood pressure. So on that note, I may finish. And thank you very much for listening. I hope I was in, I'll share. Yeah. I hope I was on time. Thanks, Anastasia. That was a wonderful start to our um, uh, event tonight. Um, and now uh, it's my pleasure to pass over to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dean Picone. Uh, Dr. Dean is a Heart Foundation funded postdoctoral research fellow at the Menzies Institute at the University of Tasmania. His research focuses all things related to measuring blood pressure accurately, which is perfect for uh, the, the presentation we want to hear from him today, which is all about how to best measure your blood pressure at home and purchase, advice on purchasing a validated device. Thanks, Dean. Over to you. Thanks very much, Nat. Um, and thanks, um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'll get straight into it. I hope you can see my slides. Just put that on full screen. Do I need to switch that? Oh, well, that's okay. Okay. Uh, you might, sorry, you might want to switch it. Yep. Okay. How's that? Okay. So, uh, as Nat said, I'm going to talk about how to best measure your blood pressure at home and also how to purchase a validated device. So, let's get straight into how to best measure your blood pressure at home. So why does it matter how I measure my blood pressure? Well, you need to follow a specific recipe or at your risk of not getting it right. So uh, if you're baking a cake, for example, you want it to turn out like this. However, if you don't follow the recipe, then you're at risk of uh, your cake turning out far differently. It's the same with blood pressure. We need to follow the recipe to make sure that we're getting accurate blood pressure measurements. Because if we don't follow uh, standard requirements, then we're at risk of our blood pressure numbers not being representative of our true underlying blood pressure. So the potential consequences of measuring blood pressure inaccurately are incorrect blood pressure numbers. And that potentially means inappropriate clinical decisions due to inaccurate blood pressure measurements. That means that your blood pressure could be measured higher than the actual true blood pressure, and you might receive unnecessary treatment. There's costs associated with that and potential side effects. On the other hand, if your measured blood pressure is lower than your true blood pressure, there might be no action to lower high blood pressure. You may remain at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So what's the best recipe to measure your blood pressure at home? Uh, the information I'm going to present is available from this document. You can scan the QR code here. Just don't use your check-in app like I did the other day. Um, and the information was developed jointly by the High Blood Pressure Research Council of Australia and the Heart Foundation. So the first steps to uh, make sure you use a validated machine. I'm going to cover this point in the second half of the talk. Um, the next step is to make sure you've got the right cuff size, which again, you need to make sure of when you're purchasing your device. Uh, this is really critical because a cuff that's too small can give blood pressure measurements that are too high, whereas a cuff that's too large can give blood pressure measurements that are too low. The third step um, is to prepare properly. And um, if you get this right, then after this, the rest is really easy. So you need to measure your blood pressure before taking medication or doing vigorous exercise. And you should make sure that you have an empty bladder and that you avoid coffee, eating and smoking within 30 minutes of measurements. You need to sit quietly for five minutes in a comfortable environment and avoid talking. And sit with your feet flat on the floor, your back and arms supported and make sure you're nice and relaxed. After this, you need to measure your pressure. And we recommend you measure for seven days or a minimum of five in the morning and the evening. And each time you measure your pressure, take two readings with a minute in between each. 
And then the fifth step is to record the numbers. And you can use this diary, which is part of this, uh, this resource. And if you do it electronically, the numbers can be typed straight into the boxes. And then you can take this diary to your doctor who can review, review the numbers. So let's just recap the recipe. You need a validated machine. You need to use the correct cuff size. You need to prepare properly. You need to measure twice with a minute's rest, and then you need to record. And by doing that, we'll hopefully make sure that we get that, uh, the correct blood pressure numbers and that we don't end up with results that are, uh, are inaccurate and not representative of our true blood pressure. So that's how best to measure your blood pressure at home. I'm now gonna talk about how to purchase a validated device. So um, what is a validated device? It's an automated blood pressure monitor that has passed accuracy testing recommended by international scientific standards. Um, but you might be surprised to know that um, regulatory authorities actually focus more on safety for non-invasive blood pressure monitors. And so these don't need to undergo that uh, scientifically backed accuracy testing to be approved for marketing and sale in Australia. But this is also the case in nearly every country in the world. Um, and these regulatory issues might be one reason why only 20% of devices available for purchase globally are validated for accuracy. And it can be very difficult to tell the difference between validated devices and devices without any evidence of validation. And it's also important to note, you cannot rely on the marketing used by device manufacturers. So it's a global problem. Australia is not immune. Australia has around 18% of devices. Um, devices that are available in Australia, about 18% are accurate, have been validated for accuracy. You might ask, why is it important to use a validated device? Well, these devices have been shown in numerous studies to be more accurate than devices without any evidence of validation. So to purchase a validated device, you should use a, uh, you can search on a reputable registry of validated devices. So these are free online searchable lists. Um, and you can follow the practical resources available from the home blood pressure measurement document by clicking uh, here. And um, that will take you, guide you through the registry. So I'm just going to go through those documents briefly. So we've got the documents in 15 different languages, if you um, uh, prefer a language other than um, English. So you can, again, scan a QR code here for English and for all other languages. And I'm going to keep those QR codes up through the rest of the presentation. So this is what the, uh, the practical guidance looks like. So um, this takes you through using the Stride BP registry, which is probably the, the, um, the most um, well-regarded of the registries because it's backed by numerous scientific um, bodies. Um, so the first step is to uh, type into this, type into your web browser, the Stride BP address. And then simply you just need to search for your blood pressure monitor, the model number or the, uh, the company name, but you need to make sure you type this absolutely precisely because otherwise you may um, not, not identify your device. So if your device is validated, then it will come up on the screen and it will have some information about the device. However, if the device is not validated or there's no evidence that it's been validated, then you won't find any search results because these listings are only listing devices that are validated for accuracy. So the tips, some other tips for finding a validated device are really just make sure you do your research. Be very careful if shopping online because there's a much greater range of monitors without evidence of validation. And just to reiterate, make sure you get a cuff that's the correct size for your arm. So to briefly sum up, how to best measure your blood pressure at home, you can use the resource from the QR code here. Follow the recipe for accurate readings and you can't go wrong. How to purchase a validated device. Again, use these resources which are available at these QR codes and make sure you use those resources to check for proof of validation before making a purchase. And I'll just leave you with this nice quote, which is that we wouldn't fly on a plane where a pilot said, I'm going to ignore the guidelines that we have for safe travel. This is from Dr. Paul Welton, who's an eminent uh, researcher from the United States. And I think it's, um, 
it's quite a nice analogy and it's highly relevant for blood pressure measurement. We need to make sure we follow the guidelines so that we can measure our blood pressure accurately and uh, if it's high, then do something about it. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Dean. That was a great presentation. And I, I thought the QR codes were very handy. I was definitely scanning myself as you as you went through. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably have quite a few questions for both you and Anastasia in the panel uh, discussion. Uh, but for now, I'll move on to our next speaker, who is Associate Professor Ralph Gordon. Uh, Ralph is a, a GP and has been a GP for over 30 years, and he's currently working in a general practice in Fitzroy and North Carlton in Victoria. Um, his expertise is very wide ranging, but in particular, uh, Ralph, I know, has a passion and a strong expertise in cardio uh, cardiology or cardiovascular disease. And he's the perfect person to talk to us uh, more about heart health checks and why you should see your GP for one. Over to you, Ralph. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'll just get my slides up. Now, it's been great to, to hear from the previous speakers. Um, and, you know, it's interesting about getting the machines right because I'm a big fan of um, encouraging people to do home measurements. And so uh, that's really important that we do get that right. So really, I want to really talk about, you know, blood pressure, why do we actually need to treat it? And I know that sounds um, a little bit funny, but I think it's important, you know, to, to understand the thinking behind why we treat certain things. And then how do we actually determine whether someone needs treatment? Because it can vary depending on people's circumstances. So I'm just gonna take you through um, just a few things that will hopefully give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Now, one of the nice little websites that you can go to is to actually look at your heart age calculator. Now, this is me. And you can see that my heart age is a little bit above where it should be. Now, I'll, I'll blame COVID for over the last 12 months for doing that because I, I thought I was really young at heart. But this is a, a great place to start because you know blood pressure is one component of a whole lot of things that we look at that will talk about a risk around heart disease and stroke and a few other things so if you need to know whether or where you're sitting in terms of your risk great place to start here once you've got that and you think oh i need to follow this up when you go to the GP, we have um, other tools that do the job maybe a little bit uh, more precisely. And so we have what we call cardiovascular risk calculators. Um, you can get access to them yourself. So if you look at the, uh, and I'll show you some screenshots, but you know, cvdcheck.org.au, you can actually do it for yourself. And that's exactly the same risk calculator that us GPs are using. But the trick here is actually works out what your risk of having a heart attack or stroke is within the next five years. So it's not specifically blood pressure, but as you heard from Anastasia, that in fact, blood pressure is a big component into it. Um, but I, I want you to think of your total overall risk, not just one thing, because we do need to treat all the risk factors to get it right, and they all are important. So what I did then is I went on to the cvdcheck.org.au and I put in my figures. And I've just realized you can see how old I am. Sorry about hmm, I'll have to be careful about that in the future. But as you can see here, my risk comes up at 8%. We consider that a green, as in um, a low risk. Now, I think an 8% chance for me having a heart attack or stroke is still too high, but you know, that's 8% over five years. And you can see in there, it, it, it has you know, uh, my sex, my age, and age is a big drive, but of course I can't change that. You can see blood pressure and you can see I'm in the high normal range. So again, that's, you know, I could probably work on that. 
my cholesterol, it's actually not too bad, but you can see how it all fits in together. And you can also then see where things sort of come in and have an impact. And so if you haven't actually worked out what your risk is, I would encourage you to do so. And you've heard many a times before about the heart health checks, which I'll talk a little bit later on. The reason why I'm going on about the risk is because it's actually your risk that determines what we do. So if someone's blood pressure is high, but they have really low risk, we will tend to go down the pathway of lifestyle first, give them plenty of time to make the changes that they need to make because we've got time. However, if we calculate the risk and it's in fact very high, we would then start treatment on top of the lifestyle changes straight away. And in fact, at high risk, the treatment would include managing the blood pressure. It would also be managing cholesterol as well. So, you know, if you're in the high risk category, we try and manage all of the risk factors. And then of course, there's always people in the gray zone and we give them the opportunity to do lifestyle management. But if, you know, they're not quite where we want them to do, we may start medication. So you know, let's just tease that out a little bit more. So, you know, how does blood pressure really relate to this? So you can see, again, I've got two people here with exactly the same blood pressure, but you can see the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke is vastly different. You may say, why? Well, we were talking about the older you are, the higher your risk is anyway. But so this person, you know, we would try lifestyle, but we may in fact start medication, you know, fairly soon. For this person, because they're such low risk, we can give them a little bit more time to try and manage those risk factors and see how they go in terms of their blood pressure. So you can see how, you know, other factors impact on your overall risk. So just, I always want you to think just a little bit broader. It's not just the one thing, it is a whole range of things that all impact together. Now, if we take that sort of, um, sort of thing, this is another two people, as you can see, the blood pressure is exactly the same on both of these. And in this case, what I've done is I've actually changed the cholesterol. So I've given this person a higher cholesterol and now six, you know, it's not that particularly high. And the HDL you can see is a little bit, which is your good cholesterol. But her risk, 17% of having a heart attack or stroke within the next five years is really high. And so we would treat absolutely her cholesterol, we would also put her on something to lower her blood pressure. If you do those two things, we say that roughly each one will reduce the risk by about a third. So you could then reduce it right back down into the low risk category. Whereas again, for this patient, you can see 7% she's at low risk. We just may, you know, encourage her to continue with lifestyle and keep her going as well as she is. But, you know, we're obviously going to keep watching them very, very closely. Um, so you can see how blood pressure is just one aspect of the whole equation, which of course, you know, brings us on to all the things that we can actually do to impact upon our overall risk. And certainly, um, as Anastasia said, within uh, COVID lockdown, alcohol has gone up and we, you know, we need to be aware of that. But stress, you know, I've seen many people after retirement where I can actually reduce their medication. Managing the, uh, the cholesterol becomes important. But as you can see, we go all the way around. Now, really, we should be having the exercise, the smoking, the maintaining weight, eating pattern first, um, and then 
add in all these, but they all are important. And so this brings me back to a heart health check. So a heart health check is where you go visit your GP and, you know, you will usually see a nurse first who will check, um, you know, your blood pressure, your weight, a few things like that. Hopefully you've had your cholesterol check done earlier. So, and what you then do is they sit down and they look at your overall risk of having heart disease or stroke over the next five years. And then, you know, hopefully come up with a plan of what it is that you should be doing. So, you know, if you come out very low risk, then they might say, well, we'll just keep on doing what you're doing. But if it's a high risk, then we need to intervene and intervene properly. And, you know, this sort of involves you into it because, you know, you can ask for a plan or some information about, you know, you know what they've done, what it means. And please ask questions. You know, one of the most important things and, and feel free because Doctors usually respond. Well, I hope they respond to you asking questions because that's really important. And as you heard, there is a, a large number of you know, resources available. The, you know, the, the um, Heart Foundation website has a plethora of information. I'm always sending people there to um, talk about diet and activity and get people involved in the walking group. So please do make use um, of both the heart health check, do understand and know your numbers. But once you have your numbers, understand what that means for your health overall. And that's where I'm going to leave it because I'm probably more interested um, in the uh, question and answer to see what sort of things people want to know. Oh, I think I must have gone too quickly and. Um, no, I them I on the hop. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ralph. Okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, oh. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Mrs. Anne Wilk. So Anne works for Labs and Life, which is a non-for-profit organisation that uses Labrador Retriever dogs um, as a re-engagement tool for youth at risk. Anne was diagnosed with high blood pressure in 2017, and tonight she's going to give us some of her insight into what it's like living with high blood pressure. So over to you, Anne. Hi. We all good there? Okay. Living with high blood pressure. What do you mean? Most people have high blood pressure, don't they? Some people have low blood pressure but they get dizzy and faint. That wasn't me. So you take a couple of tablets and you get on with life. Isn't that how it goes? I was incredibly naive when I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. Um, it didn't mean anything to me. I had no concept of where we were gonna end up and what, what could happen to me. Um, my GP said to me, oh, don't worry. You're not having a heart attack. You'll be all right. We'll send you for a few tests, which he did. And on I went. It took me about four months before I was referred to a cardiologist and I was sent off to a di dietitian and I went, yeah, 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 we eat good food. My husband's a diabetic, so we eat the right stuff. I went off to the exercise physiologist, did all his exercise. I don't, I work with dogs, I'm out with kids, I'm in the open, I do enough exercise, but do I? Okay, and then the other question, the other thing that everybody's raised is stress. What stress was I under? I had a good job. I went out, I did my thing, I played with the dogs, I came home, had a happy marriage, my kids are grown. Did I have stress? I didn't think so. I did smoke and I lived on caffeine. And when I eventually got in to see a cardiologist, um, the wait times are quite long in South Australia, the whole, my whole aspect changed. Oh, hang on a second. This is quite serious. Um, I should be making some changes to my life. I should be thinking more about what I'm doing and what's causing this and, and where we're going to go with it and the consequences of it. So initially, my GP had said to me, oh, buy a blood pressure, a home blood pressure machine, monitor your blood pressure. And it was like a toy. It was like Christmas. I could do my blood pressure as often as I liked, when I liked. No concept of how to read it, what it meant. Didn't know about sitting properly or being calm or whatever the case may be. Then I went to the cardiologist and she told me, right, now the whole thing about sitting down, being calm, getting your right blood pressure, keeping your diary and the figures were scary. 
okay? Then I got through that stage and we started looking at, I quit smoking, I put myself on a healthy diet and the numbers wouldn't come down and they just weren't coming down. I was on medication, I was on cholesterol medication and the numbers were not coming down. So I was stressing, why are the numbers not coming down? What am I doing wrong? I'm doing everything right. What was I actually doing? Increasing my stress levels. So after a couple of months of trying to do everything right and there was no, we sat down and we went back to plan B, we set target blood pressure levels. This week, you need to bring it down. And I, I was really high. I think people are going to fall off their chairs, but I was up in the 170s. So the plan was for that week to bring it down to the 160s. Then the next week was trying to get it down to the 150s. And we'd go for two weeks and so on. I got my blood pressure down. Then I had to address exercise. Why did I have to exercise? I was active. Yeah, I was strolling along at a dog's pace. I wasn't actually doing enough exercise to give my heart any exercise. I wasn't actually getting a cardiovascular workout with what I was doing. So then we had to add the walking and, and you know, beach walks and things like that into it. Healthy diet? Well, meat and three veg, yeah, that's all good enough. But what veg? What was I eating? Potato doesn't count, that's carbohydrates. So I had to rethink my diet and things like that. And I, you know, made the changes to lifestyle and my blood pressure's come down and down and down. And I'm, I'm sitting at the, but in the 130s, so sort of the high end, still at the risk end, but it is down and the medications hopefully are decreasing. Stress, okay, that I think has been the biggest change was stress. I was all very, what stress? I'm not under any stress. I've got a great job. I work with kids. Do I? I work with kids that are at risk. These kids are traumatized. They're abused. They're sad. They're dirty. They're lonely. They live in care homes. I take that home with me and mull over it and worry about it and thinking, are they going to be all right? And things like that. I was an absolute fiend about housework. I'd absolutely freak out if my house wasn't 100% clean. And that used to drive me up the wall. I've got dogs in the house. I can't have both. Things like that. You have to actually sit down and think about it. I used to worry about what my kids were doing. Were they cooking dinner? Were they going out too late? Were they getting up in time to go to work? I had to let that go. They don't live with me anymore. Not my problem. So my stress levels came down and my blood pressure came down with it. Okay, so um, I became obsessed with my blood pressure at one stage. I read everything I could possibly come across on Google. And that's also not a good thing because then it sits, you sit there and you go, oh, I've got this twinge in my, oh, oh maybe oh, I better go to the blood pressure machine or, oh, I don't feel well. I'm a little bit tired. I better go to the blood pressure machine. So you become a de you get become dependent on your blood pressure readings, which was quite stressful. Again, building up my stress levels, trying to manage my high blood pressure became an issue in my life until I learned to calm down, do my blood pressure on a regular basis and don't stress the, the higher than normal. If it was just one or two little higher than normals, as long as it stays fairly in the low brackets. So I can only say what everybody else has reiterated. It's exercise, it's managing your stress levels, it's eating properly, and it's having a good, in my case, my cardiologist is wonderful, and guidance. I think that is probably the most important thing. Don't try and swan it along on your own, because you're not going to get there. I learned that it's not a nothing diagnosis. It's serious, and it can have serious consequences. It must be managed and it is vital to manage it for your own mental well-being. Um, I've had to learn to think about things. I've had to learn to say no. I've had to learn to get home and switch off for things from the day to take time for myself. I think all of that has sort of brought the blood pressure down quite a bit. And um, it's a conscious effort. You, you have to make a conscious effort to actually think about time for myself what am I doing what am I stressing about why am I getting myself into this state so at this point in time I'm five years after my initial diagnosis um I haven't had the heart attacks I haven't had the strokes which is a bit of a relief but um I'm hopefully on my way to dropping my medications I'm pretty scared to go in and do the um cardiovascular risk cardiovascular risk calculator 
because I pretty much think I'm going to be at the top end of the percentages. Um, but, you know, that, those are all good tools and tools that um, learn, we'd, we'd learn to work with. But I'm, as I said, I just think about it, it is about learning to live with it. And, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that then. Thank you very much, Anne. That's a wonderful insight. And I'm sure a number of people in the webinar can relate to your experience as well. As an exercise physiologist, I'm glad that you touched on the importance of exercise and how many of us think we are exercising, but we're perhaps not stressing our cardiorespiratory system enough to get those um, beneficial effects that we need to lower blood pressure. So I'm now going to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you do have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I have seen a few that have already come through and some have also been sent in um, earlier. So I might start with the ones that have been sent in earlier. Um, so I might direct this first one to you, Anastasia. Um, what can be done about lowering high blood pressure due to genetics? Good question. <laughs> Um, I think it's important to keep monitoring it and so um, unfortunately we all can't change our, our parents or our families but the important thing is we can manage it and hopefully uh, not necessarily because we've got 50% of both parents we, we may be able to, to pre prevent or delay it. Having said that it's important as we covered all the factors, stress, uh, lifestyle, weight, uh, all of the above contribute. Uh, but unfortunately, we have that residual. So if we're doing all of that and we still have high numbers, then we're going to start medication. And I have to say I'm on medication because I had strong positive history on both sides and I didn't have blood pressure until I was 40. And then afterwards it was borderline and eventually I'm on treatment. Thankfully, I think I'm okay. So the side effects are not that great. Yeah. Yes, great. it's interesting about the genetics because I, I know both my parents are on treatment for blood pressure. So I keep thinking, how long is it going to be before I'm going to need something? So I'm going okay at the moment, but it will eventually happen. Excellent. All right. So I might direct the next one to you, Dean, because this is about um, home blood pressure monitors. Which reading should be taken as correct when a home monitor registers a difference of 15 millimetres of mercury within a few minutes, the lower one or the higher one? Or would you recommend doing something else? Um, so based on the presentation, I'd recommend taking the average of the measurements, um, but it's really important to record all those numbers and take the results to your doctor. That's the most important thing. They know you the best. Um, neither is really correct or incorrect. In most people, blood pressure will decrease after the first measurement. But um, one study from the Australian Health Survey data has shown that in up to 30% of people, blood pressure might actually increase after the first measurement. Okay. And, and certainly in that situation, if I saw such a huge drop, I'd be saying, wait five minutes, do it again. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that it then tends to settle around a, a certain figure. And that's the one that we're probably more interested in. Um, but uh, yeah, but every so often I do see people whose blood pressure go up because they get worried about the result. So, which is and interesting in its own right. And also measure on more than one occasion, not yes. just one occasion, really critical. We can't rely on a single measure and we can't rely on an, a clinic measurement alone. Mm -hmm. All right, Ralph, I might direct the next one to you. So this is um, maybe a bit of a controversial one around the uh, um, COVID-19 and the vaccines. So the question is, my blood pressure <laughs> was always normal, 120 over 70, up until I had my AstraZeneca jabs. All of a sudden it jumped to 155 over 91 and has continued to stay high. I'm now on medication. Is there any explanation for this, do you think? Yeah, look, I, I'm not aware of anything um, or, or any link between the two. Um, maybe it was because after the vaccination, um, people become a little bit more aware of how they're feeling and may have gone to the doctor and had it checked. Um, and, you know, it, it's just then people have realised her blood pressure is high. But I'm not aware of any link between the two, no. 
Okay. Now the next one's about key lifestyle changes to come off taking uh, medication. So Anne's touched on exercise and diet. Does anyone want to comment on what they think is the number one factor Ooh. to address? Oh, I, so, I don't go number one, but what I would say, there's a great diet called the DASH diet. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the DASH diet is a diet that was specifically designed for people with high blood pressure. And it's one of only two diets that have got proven mortality benefit. So DASH, dietary adjustment of sodium for hypertension, um, it's basically a modified Mediterranean diet. And I recommend it to everyone. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe um, Nash, Ralph, Anastasia may be able to comment on this. Is there an interaction between commonly, commonly prescribed um, high blood pressure medication? Oh, I hope so. That's why we give it. Because, see, see, okay, so the way we think as doctors, if we give one tablet, there are other tablets sometimes that work really well with other tablets so they interact to make a, a, a sum that's better than each individual one so yes I, I like those sort of interactions and so many of you will be on an ACE or an ARB if you mix that with a diuretic you get a fantastic response so yes I hope there's an interaction because that's what we're hoping for can I just add along those lines? Uh, we recommend different um, medications because they work in different sites. So the whole issue about blood pressure, which we didn't get to cover because of our short presentations is that it's multifactorial. You've got your blood vessels reacting or not dilating or expanding. You've got your kidneys controlling. You've got your brain controlling blood pressure. All of these factors together. And that's why some work better in some area regions and others. And so they're complementary. Having said that, that while very few people are on a single medication, there are people who are well controlled on a single medication. So it's, it's really important to, to look at what lifestyle factors. And this is why having a consult with a heart health check or, 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 uh, or, or your doctor is important because we forget what we eat. You know, we might have a snack and like me, I'm a social eater. So I'll have an, a, 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 a a, 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 a piece of cake or something with my coffee, all of that adds to it. Fat is a big issue at the moment. Sugar is a big, big issue globally. We, mm. we can't underestimate that. One thing before we move on though, um, about interactions, there are medications that people can take that will interact or actually make our blood pressure tablets work less. Anti-inflammatories, you know, tablets that we use for arthritis, um, do actually, um, you know, undermine the effect that we're trying to get with blood pressure medications. And that includes Nurofen. So if you're taking over-the-counter medicine, always check with the chemist or the pharmacist to make sure that it's okay with the tablets that you're on. Great. Thanks, Ralph. Yeah. Oh, that's why yeah. I highlighted that, that if you've got another condition, it's really important to be aware that, that, that whatever you're taking for that condition, not only just um, a neurofen, but other may increase your blood pressure. So that leads us nicely onto the next question. Thanks, Anastasia. And in the interest of time, I know we've got a lot of questions that have come in. If any of the panelists feel like um, typing an answer to the questions, please um, go ahead and do that. That would be great so we can get an answer to everyone. Um, so the next question is, what is the connection between blood pressure and arthritis? And Anastasia, you mentioned this in your talk, so maybe you might want to give a response. Uh, good question. Um, there, there, there is a high connection. It's an association at the moment. I'm actually involved in collaborative research here at the Colling Institute, where we're looking at what the mechanism is. But significantly, hypertension is continually an issue, and it could be due to the the, mechan uh, the mechanism of hypertension causing inflammation, but there could be other factors which we're looking into. But importantly, consistently around the world, there's a high association of hypertension in people with arthritis. It's not related to lack of activity, and I have arthritis and I've had hip replacement for it. It's not related to because people with hand arthritis will also have hypertension. Hey, thank you, Anastasia. Now, I apologise to everyone. The cleaners have just started vacuuming behind me. So uh, sorry if you can hear that. 
Um, so I'm just having a look in the in the questions. Um, uh, while you're looking, I've got to answer this one about, you know, are you suggesting that as you get older, you've got to get fitter? Look, in my job, I see the opposite. As people get older, they lose muscle bulk, they lose strength, they lose cardiovascular fitness. So I'd love to say yes to that um, because, you know, activity and keeping yourself healthy is one of the most important things that will allow you to enjoy your uh, older years like me. So, but you, the age we is a non-modifiable risk factor. So you're right, your risk goes up, even if you're healthy, your risk will go up as you get older. I can't undo that, but keeping yourself really super fit, fantastic. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, so we've had one question come in about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Um, and that the, the question is about um, being uh, diagnosed or having mild um, diastolic hypertension and what is the significance of this? Um, perhaps Anastasia or Ralph, would you like to answer that? Well, women tend to have um, diastolic hypertension definitely and it's, it's basically um, related to the heart and, and, and dilation of the heart. It may be an early indicator but it is well, it's very much um, worth pursuing and ambulatory is a good way to measure it. If Ralph wants to add anything further, that's fine. That's right. I was typing an answer furiously. Look, um, I think, again, to me, it's all about what the risk is in the long run. And if it's mildly elevated in someone who's otherwise healthy, you would go down the, the same um, advice that we're giving for everyone. But there becomes a threshold at which then you say the risk is unacceptable. And then we start shared decision making, hopefully get involved the person, but we would then talk about when is it time to intervene. Great, thank you. So another question that's come in is, um, it says, I'm on a beta blocker for fast heart rate as well as blood pressure tablet, but I'm working hard to lose weight by exercising and eating well. I'm worried what happens if I don't need medication anymore? Is it dangerous to be taking the medication if I turn around my blood pressure in the short term? How will I know if it's time to reduce the medication? Nat, perhaps you might want to comment on that as a risk reduction manager. Yeah, sure. I'll get started. I'm sure Ralph um, can add to it. I, I think um, this is the, this is really the value of regular checkups with your, your doctor. Um, don't be worried that um, your uh, changes in the changes in your lifestyle will, will be so dramatic that overnight your blood pressure will drop um, significantly or anything like that. The changes that you're uh, contributing to by changing your lifestyle are gradual and they will hopefully build up to reducing your blood pressure over time. I'd say keeping up regular checks with your doctor are the first most important step you can take. And at that point, um, you know, uh, Ralph will attest to this, that they'll, they'll keep a close eye on your blood pressure and other risk factors and um, wean you off the medication if that's appropriate. Um, I probably, as a pharmacist, I'll also just jump in and say um, medications aren't always bad. They help us reduce um, things like blood pressure, but also other risk factors and help prevent uh, heart attacks and strokes and so uh, it's not always a bad thing to be on medication but I appreciate you know you're working very hard to reduce your um, need for them. So look I'd like to add that I mean even though a beta blocker is a blood pressure medication it's used for many other things and so even if you get your blood pressure right you may have to stay on it because of your fast heart rate. So that's something that you need to sit down with your doctor or your cardiologist and have a good chat to um, because they may be doing it for completely different reasons. Okay, thank you both. So I'm just having a look at the, the questions that we've got. Um, one more asking, are there any tips for monitoring um, nocturnal hypertension? Does anyone want any thoughts? Oh, I thought Anastasia might have taken that one with her research interest. I, because... I did type the answer to it by oh. my, my, having an ambulatory blood pressure study. Yes, uh, but, but it, it's yeah. important, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, so and I, and I, at, the, at the moment, uh, we, there are home monitors which have, you can program, but they only record 
three measurements overnight, but certainly an ambulatory blood pressure test, which are available now uh, with a, an MBS item number through your GP, yes. um, is the, the most reliable. And it's, it's an important point. Uh, it's independently shown. So you can have, I've seen many people who have, can have a normal blood pressure during the day, but their blood pressure doesn't decrease at night. Really important, however, to note that they whether they've slept, because if you don't sleep, you don't decrease your blood pressure. <laughs> um, and also, as I highlighted, if you have got sleep apnea, it may show up as an early indicator. So having an ambulatory blood pressure study is certainly the best way to, to rule out nighttime blood pressure elevation. Great. Thank you, Anastasia. And I see that you're um, commenting on the final question that's come through, which is what should the blood pressure be for a 73-year-old male? So. And it's certainly not age plus 120, I can tell you now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have a response for that? Or yeah, I started to and then I stopped because the ambulatory came. Uh, yeah. I'm the same as Ralph. It, it's, it needs to be the same. Having said that, um, it's really important. There have been enough uh, uh, testing now to show the lower the better as long as we don't feel lightheaded. And that comes with monitoring your blood pressure at home, as, as we've all said. The more you, you and we don't, we're not asking you to be fanatical about it, but if you're monitoring it away from the clinic is what we're trying to say, then you're more likely to have it under control. So the, it, it really is for all of us, irrespective of age, whether you're six years old or 80 years old, it should be below um, uh, 130 or 80, I would go. And, and that's the important thing. I didn't highlight it, but the out of office measurements are lower than the clinic measurement threshold. And we know that, in fact, uh, the studies have now shown us that treating people in, now, how you define old is always a, a hard thing, but certainly treating people who are elderly saves lives. And we, if we do get them down to the same targets that we have for everybody else, it will save lives, and especially in strokes as well. So it is important, you know, you don't say, oh, it's only up because I'm old. No, that's not the case. It is important to treat. Absolutely. All right. In the interest of time, as we are past 8 p.m. here in Tasmania, um, I'd like to thank all of the panellists very much for your contribution tonight and also all of our attendees for the great engagement and questions that you've sent through. I really hope that you've learned something tonight about um, the risks of um, high blood pressure and how to manage your blood pressure. If you do have any questions that we haven't addressed, please feel free to contact us at the High Blood Pressure Research Council of Australia. You can Google our website and, and contact us there. So thanks everybody and uh, have a good evening.